So we are here today with Dr. Nalan Dharmapriya, who is a, G- a GP and part of the Whole Food, food Revolution in, I'd say, Brisbane. Are you Brisbane? Yes. Oh, I am. Brisbane. Beautiful, oh. sunny Brisbane. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Well, yeah, better than Melbourne. <laughs> I was really lucky to meet you last year a couple of times at the Low Carb Down Under in Sydney and then at the Keto um, weekend that ha- uh, Emma Martin put on in Absolutely. Brisbane. Yes, yeah. which was wonderful. Um, and I've really, you know, resonated with with the way you practice uh, medicine. You tend to bring um, your whole heart and your whole value of who you are as a human being to the work that you do. And I think that is such a, a breath of fresh air. Um, but, you know, recently, you know, I think those of it, you, those that know you know that you've been through a really tough time with a family member who unfortunately passed away from cancer. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm honoured that you are here sharing what you're going to share. So do you want to just start with a little bit of, you know, yeah, who you are, why you're here, what's kind of happened over the last few months? And Thank you, Tracy. And thank you for giving me this opportunity because I do, I felt, I do feel really strongly about this subject and, and I'll, I'll go through it so that your, your listeners understand. So, um, just before Christmas, no, beginning of January, my um, brother, 53-year-old, absolutely fit and well, um, was diagnosed with a metastatic uh, lung cancer with multiple metastases to his brain. Now, um, he was only he was he only had symptoms for two weeks before he was diagnosed, and that was just um, um, dizziness and blurred vision. And, you know, being coming from a South Asian family, we thought, oh, he's having a stroke and were, was really shocked to find that he's he's got this diagnosis. And so that's a stage four cancer. And, uh, you know, it was it was uh, very scary for him. He's not a medical person. He's an engineer. He lives in the States. And um, and, um, you know, as you can imagine, it came out of the blue. And so the family, we all uh, went to to see him and support him. And um, so he needed quite a few things. So this was um, because he had so many uh, metastases or, you know, lesions to the brain. If you think of the brain, the brain is a closed cavity. The, the skull limits it. So if there's only a small amount of space within the brain. So when you have multiple, he had up to 20 metastases in his brain. So the pressure in the brain from these what we call um, space occupying lesions was massive. And so there was a real concern that when you have pressure, this can cause a a lot of problems, including sudden death from um, part of the uh, the lower part of the brain becoming compressed. So it's it's a very dangerous situation. So his uh, surgical team suggested that he has a craniotomy, which is that they took part of uh, the, the biggest lesion out of his brain. So, and he, he, that was again, a very scary thing, but he went through that really well. And he, he was, he did really well. He came out of the surgery uh, with no real drama. So that was a, the first Good, great. Um, but then, um, uh, so he was also started on high dose steroid medication, and this is the this is the usual medication that that people with any brain lesion will start on to keep the 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 inflammation and the pressure within the brain to keep it under control. Um, so, but after he had the the brain surgery, uh, that that steroid medication wasn't necessary because he was they'd removed a chunk of the brain, so they they re- they stopped the the steroid. Um, but then, what happened was that two weeks later, his symptoms recurred, and when they went and looked at his brain again, not only had um, the the existing lesions enlarged but there were multiple new lesions as well so this was just within two weeks um so they obviously had to get the 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 steroids back on at a much higher dose now because this happened just before christmas um and because we're in the us here um 
the system is slightly different. So a lot of the US, as you know, the medical system is based on an insurance scheme. Mm. So what happens is that to for any so for certain um, med, um, for any kind of illness, including cancer, the insurance companies have to agree to fund the treatment. Um, so for luckily for my brother, his insurance agreed to do that, but it takes time. These things don't happen in a day. And because it was just before Christmas, there wasn't really things. Well, they took time. I mean, and he didn't have time, right? And, and he didn't have time, but they took time. And, and that was it was what it was. And there was nothing we could do about it. Um, but in the meantime, um, they found that his the primary lesion was in his lungs. They did a lung biopsy. And actually, that was a very good result that came out of it. The lung biopsy suggested that he had this particular lung cancer that, um, that was really amenable to what we call targeted um, therapy. So it's like a it's not like an immune therapy, but it's a specific targeted therapy for this particular lung cancer that he would have to take long term, but that would improve his survival significantly. Now, as it was before with that stage four diagnosis, he had probably, you know, six months to a year at the most. But with this targeted therapy, he potentially could have had much longer, possibly five, 10 years, who knows longer. So that was very positive. So he was he he came out of hospital with a very positive outlook, even though he had this you know recurrence of this brain uh, the metastases everything was positive and just so, on that, just, yes can you clarify with the lung cancer because i think everyone thinks oh it's a smoker and you know that you know not that there's a judgment in that but he wasn't a smoker either, no was he? he was never he never smoked a tracy and he was the the healthiest person because and he was so active his passions were always outdoors he was mountain biking hiking skiing swimming um, if he could live outdoors that's what he would be and uh, the family generally had a reasonably uh, good um, diet you know they they weren't they, you know they they were always conscious of what they ate yeah. so at this point just before christmas um uh, you know he's he was relatively stable now he's waiting to start radiation therapy in the new year he was waiting to start this new medication in a in, in a few days time so i thought uh, with my uh, kind of area that i specialize in you know with the low carb nutrition and keto you know this lifestyle and um, i thought okay i am going to go over um to the us and spend some time with my brother and really i wanted to kind of give him an opportunity to learn about how to do keep keep you know how to uh, adopt a ketogenic diet and we'll talk about why that is um to be in ketosis and to introduce him to some fasting so i went over just really to support and to spend time with him and um and when I when I was there, so first when I went he was he wasn't sleeping he was sleeping two hours per day per, per night um, and when I first went, he was tired as expected. You know, he was, as you would expect somebody with a stage four cancer. He was tired during the day because he wasn't sleeping. Um, but as the days went on, I noticed that despite this lack of sleep, he his energy levels started to increase. Now, initially I thought, well, oh, this is amazing. This must be the keto diet. Because it was like from two in the morning till midnight, he's up, he's up, he's kind of, and do, when he got this diagnosis, the stage four cancer, uh, and then that secondary, slightly better prognosis, he decided that he wasn't, he was going to live his life. He'd always lived his life, but he was going to kind of, you know, do everything that he wanted to do. And one of the things that he really wanted to do was he wanted to upgrade. I mean, this might, everybody's different, but he wanted to really upgrade his home because he built this home um, with his wife 10 years previously. And at the time he didn't have sufficient uh, funds to do everything that he wanted to do. But now he felt, okay, this was the time. So by the time I got there, it was absolute mayhem, Tracy, because there were parcels coming from Amazon 
morning, noon, and night. Things were arriving, and this was, you know, uh, I it was um, appliances for the kitchen, or new furniture, or he's a photographer. He loves photography. Multiple different cameras, lenses, because he loves mountain biking. These uh, bicycles, I mean, like five bicycles, like, and... And, and then he was rearranging the whole house. So the house was being, you know, all the existing furniture and all the stuff was being thrown out. And it was, it was chaos, right? But, but he seemed really happy. He seemed really happy. But as the days went on, I realized that, I don't know, there was something not right. He was talking a lot. My brother has always been somebody who's very quiet. He, he talks when he wants to talk. But I realized that, from morning till night, you could hear the drone of his voice. He was always talking. Sometimes he was excited. Sometimes he was annoyed. He'd be irritated if we didn't all feel the same passions that he felt, um, you know. And then, as and then he, I realized that he was becoming very emotionally labile. Mm-hmm. Um, he'd be really happy one minute, but then happy crying another minute then angry and irritable and getting more um, aggressive verbally, um, which, you know, he's always kind of, you know, he's always been somebody who could manage his, uh, his, um, his emotions. So I, I, I thought, what, what's going on? It just, didn't seem right and then and and I'm there as a sister right I'm not there as a doctor as a clinician I'm there just to support him as his family as his family and my parents they're they're both in their 80s they were there too and um and then my mum she just mentioned we were talking and she said Nellum you know he talks a lot he's never talked a lot and then it was like cling 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 it just he basically had an episode of acute mania tracy so an acute manic episode so he's so this is a a a a, a, a situation where you just you just lose that control of your thoughts really and you go into this hyper excitatory state Um, and people who have had acute mania know that it's a very distressing time because um, you know you so the you just lose the the usual um, what are the words the the constraints on the mind so the tip he had every single symptom this excessive energy not requiring to sleep uh, talking and these gra- what we call grandiose ideas so in behind all of this is this I am wonderful I can do all these things my my mental clarity is better than I it has ever been and despite this cancer I'm doing so well I can do all this and you know all of these kind of thoughts spending I mean the amount of money he was spending every morning we'd wake up and he'd spent thousands of dollars and and I'd say to him you know can how about we wait till you're a little bit better but no 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 I am going to get better I'm going to fight this and I'm going to write a book and I'm going to do all of these things and and then the other thing is that the loss of insight so for somebody who has a manic episode they don't realize that there's something wrong they feel amazing They feel as if they're on top of the world. Nothing can get them down. And anybody who suggests that there could be something wrong is um, is the bad person. So we had to be very, very careful in in the way we spoke about things and tiptoeing around the house. And because it'll be one minute, he'll be so great. And, you know, he has two kids and the same thing with them as well. One minute, he'd be this amazing, loving dad. And the next minute, he'd be like, flip and get really angry because of something that uh, they'd said. So this went on for a few days. And I thought, oh, my gosh. So one of the com- most common reasons for this, I mean, there, for him, there were probably multiple reasons because he had these metastases in his brain that could impact um, I- impact this as well. But um, the high dose steroids 
um, steroids is one of the reasons that they, they are a commonly, not commonly, but it is a well-recognized side effect, um, this steroid-induced manic episode. And also the fact that he wasn't sleeping. Not that that can, but it could have, it probably made his situation worse because the, the less you sleep, the more uh, uh, excitable the brain is. So, and then trying to get, so he was under the care of an oncologist, trying to get some assistance to manage this condition because I could feel that we were heading into a dangerous territory because as every day that progressed, he was getting more volatile, more erratic, and his outbursts were a little bit more intense. And I was worried because I now only had a few more days left in my in my trip. And I thought, well, how, how I can't leave here with this situation as it is, because, you know, there were vulnerable people at home. So trying to contact his oncology team to say he needs an assessment, either his, we need some way of either reducing the medication, he needs a psychiatric assessment. Well, this was really tough, Tracy, because, um, um, you know, trying to get hold of anybody to do this, because firstly, none of the clinicians, you cannot contact anybody via email. You can only call them. You can only call them. And, and being a GP and knowing how busy people are, it was it was very difficult to just pick up the phone and call. So what I did, I I actually went one day, I wrote so many letters and I went with my dad in the morning. He had an appointment that afternoon with his oncologist. I went in the morning and I handed out these, these letters to all his team and said, this is so important. These letters have to be read. So that by the time we actually went for the, the the appointment, they had the letters. And I had said in that letter that just to keep this at this moment, just keep it, you know, try to avoid telling them that I, I, I have brought this to their attention. So they were very good, the, the initial radiation oncologist. Um, and he suggested that we reduce down the, the medication. Um, but uh, so that was great. That was a good start. But then the symptoms weren't getting any better. And there was, this is literally just, you know, that we reduced the medication on this particular day. And by the next day, things were still still not bad, uh, still not good, because it takes a few days for things to yeah. happen. And in the meantime, I was contacting his main oncologist and um, it was really difficult to get through. But eventually uh, she she called me and um, and basically, I mean, what she said was, well, we're oncologists. Um, so I said, well, yes, but this, your patient has all these, you know, he is not well. Not only has he got the, the cancer and all the issues regarding that, but now he's got a mental health, a significant um, worrying mental health condition, most likely triggered by the medication that he was given. Um, and uh, she said, well, you just need to get, if, if he's a risk to anybody, you need to get him into hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, Tracy, I, I mean, listen, I myself as a GP have said these words to my patient. And I regret saying these words to my patient because it is incredibly difficult to get somebody, an adult male uh, in the prime of his life who is experiencing a manic episode to just go into hospital. It is impossible because yeah. why he in his mind he's There's the best he's ever been. That's yeah. right, in, and so, so you can't physically no. restrain them. I know no. it's it is crazy. very and in the US, if we called um, the 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 ambulance or and said the words that there is a risk here, the police attend. It is it is very very scary. We did not want to do that. I didn't want to do that. But then, as I was I was really I was like, well, how am I going to get my brother admitted? He needed he needed he needed admission, not just to be seen as an outpatient, because there was also the worry that he hadn't yet started his radiation therapy for his brain. So the steroids were absolutely essential for his well-being from the cancer point of view. But then this was also causing this, man this mania. So we were in this very difficult situation of uh, he had to be in hospital to be, for this to be managed. So um, 
then as I was worrying and really worried about this, the next morning, he developed what we call acute urinary retention. So this is a, a this is a urological emergency, and this just hey. anyway, there was a little bit of a story to it, but basically he couldn't pass we he couldn't urinate, and um and when that happens, the bladder so his bladder was up to his umbilicus, and um, this is a dangerous condition because if we don't release the bladder, then it, it could perforate, it could it could rupture. And so, so I, we managed to get him in. And in, in my <laughs> head, I'm thinking, oh, my, this, my poor brother, because he was in so much pain for that. But thank goodness, because now I can get him seen by somebody. Wow. So we got wow. him into hospital and got the whole urological side sorted. And then, and tried. So then I'm like behind the scenes talking to anybody I could talk to. I can imagine. But but still, it was like, okay, the, the the situation is under control. We are going to discharge him. I'm like, what we, you cannot discharge him. There's another condition. And I I must have made such a, a nuisance of myself, Tracy, to everybody. Because, and I had to say, you know, there is a risk involved. He cannot come home yet until his mental health is under control. Mm. So finally, finally, they they. they Kept hold held on to him. They reduced his doses of steroid, um, and they put him on something to help him sleep. Because during while he was at home, he was given sleeping medication, but very very tiny doses because the oncologist was so worried about the addictive potential. And fair enough, but much less than we would use here in general practice. So mm. it, it wasn't working. It was mm. it didn't help him. So but as an inpatient in hospital, he was um it, they were able to do that properly. So um so at that point now he is in hospital, his symptoms were starting to improve. And and um so those manic uh, those very kind of um out there ideas and the 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 crazy spending money all of that started to gradually improve and then the the oncologist decided that they would uh, start his radiation brain radiation therapy um while he was in hospital now in the middle of all of this just before um just before the beginning of january he did get his medication that was approved by his um um uh, insurance company for his lung cancer so he'd started that he'd been on that by this time for about two weeks um so I felt now this by then I had actually extended my stay but now I felt that he was in the right hands and my parents and I when parents live in Australia too we travel back to Australia so and we were keeping tabs on him and then my sister who is also in Victoria she decided right now since I was back that she would go um, okay. to she would go and see him she a gp she's she's a radiologist so very very good because uh, it just really helped so so now you know then it turned out so as now he's he's receiving his radiation therapy his 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 moods and all of that is under control but then two days after he started his radiation therapy for the brain he started becoming breathless and um and um, and you know so and he needing oxygen now this was very unusual because um, he was he didn't have any issues with his lung function before and then they uh, um, they, they they did tests and they realized that he had they grew uh, a virus and a bacteria so they thought that this was a pneumonia and they started giving him antibiotics and and he needed and continued with the oxygen and a whole week went past Tracy and um, he wasn't improving and and he's still in hospital he's still saying. in hospital he's needing oxygen every day and and now he's getting to the point where he can't talk because every time he, they take the oxygen mask off he's so breathless and i'm thinking what is going on you know if if it was an uh, an infectious process you surely this would have settled down and then researching the medication it we realized that 
the medication that he was on to help with his lung cancer, there's a 2%, less than 2% of people um, get a, a, a condition called interstitial lung disease, which is an inflammatory process of the lung, which if you get it, there's a 50% chance that you will die. And, and we knew that this was it because, and uh, so then they, you know, looking at doing further investigations, they found that that was it, that he had this inflammation that, so you know how in COVID, COVID time, we had a lot of people um, who died of uh, lung related disease and that was more an immunological reaction against the virus so very similarly this medication caused an immunological reaction in the lungs which literally it just caused massive inflammation to build up in the lungs and um and Obviously, the, an antibiotic, it wouldn't matter how many they gave. No, and, no it and it's not antibiotic. It. It's, no. it's, not an, it's not bacterial. It's no. not an antibiotic. So unfortunately for my brother, what happened is that the treatment here, Tracy, is high-dose steroids. Um, and, and, and the thing is, I mean, not, they, it wasn't that anybody did anything wrong because the problem is that you cannot start high-dose steroids on someone if you suspect them to be having an infection. So, so because there was this infection and that's what they treated, that, pro, that postponed the steroid getting in by a week. And by the time the steroid did get in, it was too late. And, he, and so by the time my sister went, so she went about 10 days after I left, um, he, she was shocked when she went to see him because he was literally bed bound, oxygen, a lot of muscle wasting. He was like half the man he was before and um and um and and then so basically he 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 became so exhausted from trying to breathe himself that the next step was that he had to be intubated so that he could be ventilated mechanically and at that point um, my parents and I decided well, we had to go again so we we got in just um, in in time because as we he was in ICU being ventilated but he had a little bit of he wasn't um, he he was able to hear us he couldn't speak but he could respond he knew we were there when he saw that we were there he had two big tears when he not saw but when he heard us two massive tears that rolled down his face but we were so glad that we were there because two days later um, we had to stop or everything because he simply, even with high dose oxygen, mechanical ventilation, um, he was not maintaining his oxygen levels and he wouldn't be able, being able to do that, you know, without, um, without this support. And, you know, we, as a family, the whole family, uh, not just my parents, my sister and I, but his, 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 uh, wife, and his two children, we were all there in the room together and we decided, we discussed all the pros and cons and decided that uh, it wasn't beneficial to him to keep uh, this going and to keep him alive. So we stopped the ventilation and it was the right thing to do because he didn't even take a single breath after that. And um, so the reason, you know, it was... So he died within two months, less than two months of his diagnosis from um, he suffered, you know, the manic episode was a drug reaction. And then this um, the interstitial lung disease was also related to the drugs that he was on. So the reason I feel that I wanted to come on and talk about this, Tracy, is that, you know, these medications that we treat use to treat cancer, um, they are also toxic. They are also, you know, poison. So we, they are not without um, their own problems. And I think, you know, we don't use we don't use the 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 holistic, you know, the options that we have that we know that work. 
So, um, and we can talk about, and you can ask me questions on the ketogenic diet. There's a lot of information now on the importance of the right diet, the right lifestyle, you know, addressing sleep, addressing um, stress management, you know, exercise, all of this, even in a stage four cancer victim, um, can make a huge difference. I don't think it would have made a difference in my brother's um, life in terms of survivor time. He probably would have um, died when he died. But I think his last few months would have been more peaceful. And um, yeah, that's what I feel. So that's why I'm here to talk about my experience. Um, and um, just to say that I think, you know, we we don't you know, the ancient um, wisdom that we have from, you know, thousands of years of, um, you know, our evolutionary biology, we have just poo-pooed them. We don't use them anyway. It's all medication. It's all these, you know, uh, techniques that we have only used for the last 50 years that we've mm -hmm. put up, our, our, you know, our beliefs in, all of that. So I think that there's a lot more that we can do in this space help people thank you for sharing that I, I think you're you're super brave and I think you know people like yourself who have an experience like this on the other side I think can bring back you know huge wisdom and insight I'm hoping I can just ask you just yes. something uh you know when you talked about your your brother got the diagnosis and there was no symptoms at all leading up to that do you do you think that perhaps they there were and they were just missed or was there literally nothing? I uh, we all asked him so many times, but the only it was he presented with just a little bit of vertigo uh, two weeks beforehand, and the problem is that you know he calls my they, they, he calls my mum every week. And when he called my mom, my mom also at 80 had a little bit of vertigo. And she said, oh, yeah, I have that. And then and then his and somebody else in, in his circle had vertigo. So he was like, oh, yeah, this is some kind of a viral thing. Yeah. Um, so really, that was the that was it. And then he started getting a bit of blurred vision. Uh, and then kind of he said to me that, like, you know, if he was going to put something into the microwave, he'd miss the, the opening. And that's when he realized oh, this is something's going on here. Mm -hmm. So, but no, I mean, he, two weeks before then, because he's a keen mountain biker, uh, his daughter who's in uh, at university had come back for some holiday and they'd gone on this massive mountain bike with a massive incline and he had no symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you know, a lot of the reading I've been doing, um, you know, it's obviously a topic I think that we are excitedly learning yes. a lot about yes. um, in in terms of alternative views, if you like, yes. and treatments. Yes. But um, it, it to me, it kind of it's, and I don't know whether you know different cancers obviously you know are diff, you know, function differently. But I've kind of been understanding that these are sometimes. 15, 20 years in the making, a lot like metabolic syndrome. If you think yes. about, you know, insulin resistance to a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, that can be 15, 20 years, yes. right? Yes. And sometimes, I and is that your understanding as well? And, you know, can it vary from cancer yeah, to cancer? I mean, I've obviously since then I've done a lot of reading and uh, uh, lung cancer in particular can present. It is one of the most likely to present with brain metastases. Um, that they, it doesn't present with anything else. He never had a cough. He never had any, nothing, nothing, Amazing. nothing. And so his symptoms simply were the symptoms of the pressure in the brain. There, there was, that, that was how he presented. So it was, he presented quite late with those symptoms. There was nothing else and he didn't lose weight. Six, um, six months before he was in Australia, they were visiting us and we went, we had, you know, a lovely time and we did all, because he loves adventure. So that's whenever we meet, that's what we do. We're always doing something out and about. And there was, no, there was nothing to suggest that he couldn't keep up or, you know, that there was something wrong. There was nothing. Yeah. So, you know, obviously you've had a huge amount of insight and reflection on this experience. And, you know, you talked about, you know, the ancient wisdom. So, 
of of treating the whole body. I I think that's what you're you're trying to say because you talked about the silos. You know, you were talking to your oncologist about a mental health issue. Well, that's not that's not my field. Yes. You know, you have to. And I think for your brother, I mean, having you there. I mean, he will never obviously, you know, know just how incredibly lucky he was for the average person who doesn't have your knowledge and insight to push through that. It's it's almost like you get into into this system and you're totally powerless as yeah. to your, I suppose, your role in that because of this siloed approach. Yes. What would you like to see change or what are some of the biggest insights you've had on on where we could look at changing um, I suppose from a patient perspective, just to make it a different journey or, or I don't know, you know, like there is so much, right? It's a big question. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, what, the other thing that I, uh, because, and, and this is something I think is really important, Tracy. So because of the way my brother presented and he was really under the care of the hospital team by the time he he presented yeah. and he didn't really have a GP involved by then wow. he has a GP but the GP was not involved in, at that moment and that I think was a real um, negative because mm. I think having a good GP who has your back who can advocate for you yeah. is really important Mm-hmm. And I, I, that is what, I mean, that would have, if there was a GP, that's I all I would have had to do is contact the GP and they would have, but because th- there wasn't a GP involved at the time and things were moving so quickly, um, it was, it was a difficult scenario. So I really encourage everybody, you know, find yourself a good GP that you get to know and they get to know you, because I think it is so important to have mm-hmm. that person when you need them. To um, advocate for you just to yeah, help manage all the absolutely the just silos. to oversee and to coordinate because that yeah. wasn't my role there I was I'm not you know I'm I'm I, I don't know the system there I was there simply as is my as as a family member as a support so um yeah and then also Tracy I think one of the things so we had started my brother on a ketogenic diet and he was doing a bit of fasting but as soon as he got into hospital his doctor said stop it stop it and it's it's of no benefit and and I didn't want to we didn't you know that was fine he had to feel that he could trust his medical team so we didn't um, get involved there so that was fine but again I feel that there is I mean there's so much now new information coming up on what we call the mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer Mm -hmm. which says that uh, it is really damage over time to the mitochondria and the mitochondria are the energy the power the energy generating powerhouses in our cells and um it, and without this how this energy that we generate well that it's that's our life force isn't it we need energy for every single thing that we do and if these mitochondria get damaged then that oh, so it's a chronic so what 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 they say with this theory is that and it's more than just the theory. There's now a lot of Absolutely. research that has been done and this has been proven time and time again. There are multiple survivors, uh, long-term survivors of stage four cancers who have gone down this path. So what they say is that chronic damage over time to the mitochondria um, reduce the ability of the mitochondria to produce adequate energy. And so that then leads to the cell adapting to a very primitive method of energy production, um, which uses um, uh, fermentation, not oxygen. So 2.5 billion years ago, before there was oxygen on this planet, uh, the cells that we, that, that obviously humans were not alive then, but the cells that were alive um, didn't well they didn't use oxygen because there was no oxygen so they used to use um, fermentation to produce energy so they used um, whatever substrate whatever fuel that they could get fermented it and produced um, an acidic environment that's fermentation not using oxygen so these cancer cells um, what happens is if over time the mitochondria get damaged Uh, and the mitochondria are not able to produce uh, adequate oxygen to sustain this cell. So this cell, they're so, I mean, 
amazing. Okay. Yes, amazing. <laughs> so they adapt. So this is not acute damage. If say you you know somebody was poisoned by arsenic for uh, by some or something like that, that would that's an acute damage that kills the cells. A, a dead cell cannot become a cancer cell. But this is over time, and that's what you said, Tracy. This is something that happens over time. You know, over a period of time, some damage has occurred, and it it hasn't killed the cell, but it's just not able to maintain its energy levels sufficiently. So it has time now to adapt to a system that gives it the ability to survive. So it's basically a survival strategy for these cancer cells, but um. So the so the fuels that they can this these cells use are usually glucose and uh, another one called glutamine, which is uh, an amino acid, which is a breakdown product of protein. Um, these are the two substrates that are used by these cancer cells, and and this fermentation process is a very inefficient method of producing uh, uh, energy. So the cell has to gen use eat up huge amounts of this fuel to be able to produce adequate energy to survive um so the idea is that if we can somehow stop um or lessen the amount or starve this cell mm -hmm. of its fuel then these cells because they're so primitive now because they they're, they're not like our normal cells in the body that are able to adapt very quickly. These cancer cells, because they're so primitive, they don't have a lot of capacity to uh, adapt for once they've become this cancer cell. So if you starve them of energy, they can't do much more. They just literally get weaker and weaker and they die. Mm. Um, so, so that is the idea behind the metabolic, the mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer that we can do two things. So if wh what can we use to starve this cell of cancer, uh, star star starve this cell of uh, fuel? It's if, well, what can we use to starve the cell of glucose? It's a ketogenic diet. It's being in ketosis, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in ketosis, then you don't have any glucose, one. Um, and also when you're in ketosis and the ketone bodies themselves are not, fermentable fuels but for us to be able to use ketone bodies as fuel we need oxygen so the cancer cells cannot use these ketone bodies as fuel so, so it's not like they would get they would get fixed you know with with the ketones they just yeah. basically starve and they die off yes they yeah. die, die. Yeah. but the ketones because yeah. we know that the ketones are so good for the rest of the body nice. they, they improve the health of the rest of the cells yeah. while starving this so being in ketosis improves the rest of the body while starving the cancer cell um so and then secondly water only fasting so that's another way of mm -hmm increasing um uh, the key uh, the, the the ketone bodies in the in the body and so this is not something that you can do long term but a lot of people who have these diagnoses will do a five to seven day water only fast every month or something and this is for the benefits of autophagy the cell cleaning mechanisms the recycling mechanisms that the body um, um goes through so 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 this this in this knowl this new theory it's not a new theory no, it's around a hundred years mm -hmm. Otto Warburg firstly um Warburg firstly uh, documented it I think in the nineteen twenties yeah. um, but you know when we went when I went with my brother for his first appointment for his new medication he asked his nurses about being you know being on a ketogenic diet they didn't know what a ketogenic diet was. So this was his oncology team and I couldn't believe it like this is this is massive you know and we're not I'm not saying you go one or the other but why it's it's why can't you do both together because there's been so many studies to show that um if you're on chemotherapy or radiotherapy and you're in ketosis uh, then you have a much better Firstly, you you tolerate these medications much better. You don't need as much in terms of dosage um, and the survival is better. So mm -hmm. 
why can't why we why wouldn't you yes know... what harm can it That's... do it's such an interesting um, approach. And I first, um, a lady, uh, one of my colleagues, Martha Tettenborn, who has a book, um, uh, Biohacking um, Cancer. Or yes. Peter, using, so it's using, so she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in her early 50s. Yes. Uh, and she, you know, was a, actually a nutrition, she's a dietitian. Right. I thought she was, you know, unbelievably healthy. So obviously it threw her off her feet and she came across the ketogenic diet after a lot of research. So she went into her chemo treatment, yes. you know, with having yes. fasted leading up to it. So this was about in 2017. She's got a book out. It's it's a great book, Use, you know, sort of going through the process of it. Process. Yeah. Um, and I met her in San Diego when I was over in at Low Carb USA last year yeah. and we were talking about it. And what she said she now understands with that is that the fasting, it, it what it, it for want of a better way of describing it, it's obviously a lot more complex than this. Yeah. But, you know, she said the the healthy cells of the body, they kind of, it's like they sink to the bottom of the pool and then you have the chemo treatment and it it really doesn't touch the healthy cells. It just yes. literally targets. Yeah. yeah. So she said that, you know, she knows now why that approach worked so well and she didn't get as sick. Um, at all she recovered a lot quicker after the treatments mm -hmm. I mean she's in full remission now and vibrantly healthy yes. um, and I think it's just you're right it's well we know why you know a lot of people don't want to look and you know yeah. it doesn't suit the the way that the medical system is set up but I think you know there is so many opportunities I suppose for people you know to empower people enough to find the yes. information to hopefully you know know that it's a safe in fact it's it's so well you know, known and understood actually, you know, yes. that it is incredibly safe and if not much more effective treatment. Yes, that's right. And, you know, and then the other things like sleep and because, you know, mm. sleep and stress, um, these things, poor sleep, uh, high levels of stress, they increase cortisol levels, increase mm. glucose within the system so that you're fueling your cancer cells. Well, as, so it's really important that these things, I mean, I mean, ideally, I would like to see where when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, whatever stage that they're offered these yes. in conjunction yes. with whatever medical therapies or radiation therapies that we have and that they are given as much in, uh, uh, importance. Yeah. But the hard thing is with that. So, you know, you people listening to you, Nellam, well, you know, I know there'll be people listening and I'll go, okay, yes. well, I know I'm, I, I would like to see Nellam and you would be yes. an, an amazing advocate for that. But then they go off to their oncologist and their oncologist will say, oh, there's no evidence of that. I, you know, that's don't, don't, you know, I think, you know, we have to empower people so much yes. <laughs> to be able to stand up to a specialist who says, you know, no, well, I'm still going to give it a go. Yes. It's very, very challenging for people, isn't it? I, I think so. And I think you're right that empowering, because mm. if all you had was the radio and chemotherapy, you are powerless and you are in somebody else's hands. Well, if you had, you could go on this, you could, you know, change the way you eat. You could start fasting, start some resistance exercise. Let's get the sleep sorted. You know, all of these and things. the light therapy as well. Have you... All of this. So mm -hmm. that, that gives the person control a little. They are also involved in their care. Which it's not just, yes, it's massive. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's massive. I think there is so, so much potential in that. And I, you know, I think it's wonderful that you're sharing what you are. The mitochondria is, you know, I've done a lot of research around it to my group. We're about to go into yeah. a whole topic around yes. it again. And I, I, I just love it, it's learning about it. And yeah. I start by saying, you know, we are really only as healthy as our mitochondria. I mean, it is, you know, and you've just described that. I think everything we can look at in terms of, well, what are the things, you know, it's so much beyond weight loss. Like, it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, Absolutely. we need to look at it in terms of our health. And one of the things I'd like to ask you too, is that there's a lot of, um, not fear, but a lot of people don't, you know, they kind of go, oh yeah, I'll go a little bit low carb, but they don't really do enough to get into ketosis. I think there's yes. a bit of a fear of, you know, well, should we be there long-term, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I think they're seeing it through the lens of simply weight loss instead of mental yes. health and obviously yeah. the the fueling of the cells. So what's your what would you say to someone around that? Is it safe long term? Do you think the body naturally mitigates, you know, in yes, and out? It's very or... safe long term because if you go back in our evolutionary biology, 
that's most more than likely where we were most of the time that we yeah. were in ketosis and that's how we were formed that's why we carry so much fat around in, in our bodies because that's what we use to fuel ourselves right yeah. um, we've got our own fuel tanks <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, and um, the thing is that if for certain conditions, it's not just about being low carb, you have to be in ketosis. Absolutely. So for things like cancer, uh, it is really important if you're doing it, you're doing it so that you actually are in ketosis. And um, um, and I think that is so epilepsy, for instance, is another one. There are certain, yeah, and a lot mm -hmm. of mental health mm -hmm. conditions mm -hmm. uh, really to maintain ketosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think... Um, uh, for for weight loss and for um, maybe um, other kind of, you know, diabetes, um, uh, heart disease, you know, things like that, you could go low carb and that could be enough. But certain conditions, I think you really need to be in ketosis to benefit. And there's yeah. absolutely no long term risk of being in ketosis, yeah. not the therapeutic, uh, the the therapeutic ketosis that we're talking about yeah no no I absolutely agree with you that's certainly what I the conclusion I've come to and every time I get an opportunity to ask a doctor who you know who really yeah. understands it that's the answer that I hear I think it's people who generally misunderstand you know the complexities of it that might yeah. talk about that but yeah. um anyway I also would love to ask you um Nilam, I'm conscious of the time hopefully you've got a few more minutes yeah, but no, that's fine you as a um just the incredible human being you are you know how did you actually manage the stress like what were some of the things that you were really conscious of going through this experience you know whether looking back on it or what you noticed going through that you think were really important for you as a family member of someone going through this to to focus on yeah so Tracy so I um I'm a practicing Buddhist and that really helped me um, because, yes, and I think that I wouldn't have coped otherwise or in, in, as well as I did. Um, I do a lot of meditation and just in Buddhism, the concept that, you know, death is is the only guarantee in life, really. And it comes, there is no guarantee when it's going to come. We are not born with a sticker that says expiry in 70 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. It comes. And I think just that realization that for my brother, this was it and that, that there is going to be loss here. And, you know, that it is the way it is. And, and I think really those roots um, going you know, really kind of digging deep into my spiritual uh, learnings and um, talking to my sister, who we both are the same. So, you know, really, that really helped. That really helped. And then being there with the whole family, um, making decisions together, um, making decisions that were more uh, were really about what was the best thing for my brother um, was was because you know it was very difficult for my sister in law and the kids um, not having a medical background and suddenly we you know here they are you know in this room and we're talking about um, you know stopping his ventilation and so really kind of being able to explain to them to talk to the specialists that were there to give them the opportunity to ask the questions and you're right Tracy how the, my brother's situation was a very complex situation how anybody else would have managed it without any medical knowledge I I I I, I feel really humbled that I had that knowledge and my sister was able to help with the radiology side of things. Otherwise, it was, you know, where would you, there's so many things that went on and this this kind of scenario must happen to so many people, the you common, know. My, that's the common scenario. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. So, yes. In that, so, I talk, not in, in terms of exactly how that played yeah, out yeah, your yeah. brother, no, but just that's right. yes. that, that system approach that you really just become a, a, a number I mean there's no one advocating for you there's no one sort of crossing over that whole mind body thing unless you have someone like yourself in your family or you have that ability to do that yourself and if yes. you're that unwell you don't I mean your brother lost you know his no, ability to no, absolutely yeah yeah very very difficult what um 
I think that that's lovely. I, well, that 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 faith, I guess, and that understanding that holds you true. I I I I'm not Buddhist, but I love the Buddhist philosophies and the practices are very similar to me as well. And I I I think there is um, a knowing that this is one part of our journey, our life here. Uh, I and that's helped me deal with you know kind of grief, knowing that it's only short term and that we'll meet again. Um, exactly. But there was a there was a program. I'm not sure if you've seen it on Netflix once. I don't even know if it's on now. Called Experiencing Death. And it yes. Was, have you seen that? I did. Yes. It's- there was one of the episodes where I talked to a um, a doctor who ended up doing a lot of study on what happens prior to someone passing and how their their loved ones tend to come back and and get them. It actually got me it gets me really emotional because I. I think, you know, we have so much of a fear around it because we don't necessarily understand it. Yes. But there is, you know, we can look at it, you know, in a, in a loving and a, a different way. Or in an, you know, yeah, uh, oh, I absolutely. Know. I think so in uh, the Buddhist traditions, we don't say rest in peace because that is not, we say, you know, because there's an ongoing journey that may your journey you know, be, you know, wherever you're heading. So there's an ongoing journey and that that journey um, will eventually end, but that it, you, you we don't rest in peace. We There's an ongoing, so there's life after life. It carries on, as you said. And so that's so, you know, um, so we wish him well in his journey. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, to finish up, I'd love you just to share any, you know, anything that you'd like to share that you haven't said or just a final sort of, you know, um, something wisdom you'd like to so say? I just, I really feel that in modern medicine that we have lost touch with, uh, with as you said, those ancient, the ancient wisdom that uh, that that we, we have, that we know is there uh, and that I think, um, you know, we put too much, um, too much, emphasis on these very new technologies that really we haven't had a lot lot of experience with and it's great that we've got you know all of this um, uh, new research going on but are we barking up the wrong tree you know all this cancer research that goes money that goes into the genetic the somatic mutation theory of cancer saying that it's a genetic disease well the last hundred years this cancer survival hasn't improved so, you know, so I think, I think we, as, as physicians, I think the medical profession, I think we need to really look back and really um, embrace um, some of these holistic therapies that have been there for many, many you know, centuries. Why do we, why do we not um, use those? Well, and I feel that when we do, it's very much a lip service. We say things like, um, oh, you need to eat well, or you need to lose weight, uh, exercise. But beyond that, there is no other instruction. So, so that's because we don't know, because we're not taught that. And, and it's not deemed important, um, not important enough anyway, as the, the pharmaceuticals or whatever. So I think, I think that is the message for me. I think we need to look beyond just this new stuff that we have but also embrace and and you know connect with all those the the ancient wisdom that we have and that's really important thank you so much dr Mellon, for sharing your story and your experience and i truly believe too that sometimes we're gifted with these experiences not because we choose them but because there's something that we are then going to be able to give to the world and i can't wait to watch this sort of unfold for you and the passion behind there's a, there's a different level of passion when it's been a lived experience yeah absolutely yeah yes thank you thank, thank you, you tracy thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat with chat to you and and your audience